All right, so I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to tell you about some of this work on magnetic crystals, and in particular, uh, how one can think about designing them for uh, perhaps some of the next series of experiments that might be, might be fun using dynamic control of magnetic properties. This is work done, uh, some of this is, uh, well, the work started with Une Soikel, who's uh, now on staff at the Naval Research Laboratory, and uh, is also involved Glade Setsuma and uh, Tianyu Liu. Uh, also some experimental collaborations with, uh, uh, with uh, Shufeng Zhang and Hong Tang at Yale. Uh, here are some of the references involved. And you know, part of the motivation for this was the idea that we might be able to uh, play with spin. And this is uh, a picture from about 15 years ago when we thought we knew how we might be playing with spin at that time. Uh, this is an artist rendition of uh, spin up electrons that are green colored, spin down electrons that are red colored, that are moving separately around some electrical circuit. And over the course of the last 15 years, we've discovered that that may not be the best way to play with spin transport and spin dynamics. You know, you may have better luck if you try to move spin around without the charge and you just involve the motion of magnets uh, in spin space carrying some magnetic wave forward. So the general area that I've been looking at this from is the area of hybrid quantum systems. I think many people here are also taking this kind of perspective that you want to try to bring together different physical systems that have different advantages. And here, magnetism is a system where you're going to have exchange-locked individual spins, you're going to have room temperature, collective behavior, you tend to have large quality factors, and your excitations are, tend to be easy to localize or isolate. Um, people very often work with electrons or excitons here. This is a nice picture of a coherent phenomena for electronic systems. Uh, the, they have very strong interactions with light, which is great. The uh, problem is they also have very strong interactions with everything else. And it's difficult to get collective behavior, these systems, without having decoherence, that is, without superconductivity. So the way to, to get collective behavior with the electronic system is to go to the superconducting system, but that rules out room temperature right at the beginning. Hence. Uh, the focus on magnetic systems as a solid state localized system to look at. And then you have light, and light gives you very large quality factors. You have also collective systems available. It's hard to keep that in one place. It's hard to localize, although not impossible. Uh, and uh, so the area that uh, we've typically been looking at is the one that kind of is in between magnetism and uh, electromagnetic waves because it allows you to mix these collective uh, phenomena and these interacting phenomena with uh, systems that allow you to transfer information quickly over long distances. So the set of topics that I put into this area of magnonics and optomagnonics that we've been working on in my group are these over here. Uh, I'm going to talk about RF photon and magnon interactions. Uh, we've also done work on three particle interactions, optical photons and magnons. So this is two optical photons and a magnon. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that today. Uh, we have looked at non-local electromagnetically mediated magnon drag. Our motivation here is trying to understand whether uh, these spin transport systems would have any parasitic effects or crosstalk between wires. And it turns out that they do just through the fluctuation induced drag for, uh, for magnons. But again, I won't talk about this in detail. And then we've been looking at some new approaches for quantum sensing, including NV sensing of magnetic response. So instead of magnetic fields, Directly, this is uh, an approach that may work 
to allow a, a, a spin coherent object to detect the response of a magnetic of a material, uh, paramagnetic or diamagnetic material that has no static um, equilibrium magnetization of itself of its own. Okay, so these are the three things that I'm going to address. I already mentioned the RF photon magnon control, uh, and then in order to talk about potential ways to connect to uh, to dynamically modulated magnetic properties, I'm going to talk about briefly about this work on electric field control of spin wave velocity uh, done with, um, with the Yale group, and then how this, this very, very small effect that you can detect in YIG could in principle be amplified in a magnonic crystal to give you something that really is flexible and might be <coughs> practical. Okay, so let's go back to this picture of, um, of matter and electromagnetic waves interacting. So this is the typical picture that we were thinking of, I guess at this point, um, about 10 years ago. Uh, we were thinking about the system where you got the ground state, and light comes in and moves, it, moves that uh, electron up to an excited state, and then the electron can fall back to the ground state and emit light again. And that gives you the mixing process, and it gives you the polariton that we've also heard about earlier today. <coughs> now, the way people would be thinking about this typically is that the electric dipole coupling, for example, which you've seen in atom, is going to be much stronger than the magnetic dipole. And therefore, you should really be looking at transitions that are going to be electric dipole transitions and forget about the magnetic dipole. So this is the kind of the the thing that we had in mind, this is from 2004, and these are the first demonstrations of solid state uh, exciton cavity mode mixing. Uh, these are two groups. This is the, uh, the Würzburg group, and this is the University of Central Florida group uh, down here. So I'm showing these images here. It's a semiconductor micropillar. There's a quantum dot that is sitting within. And the trick that both groups used in these demonstrations was uh, they were able to move one of the modes relative to the other. So here you have uh, a uh, exciton mode there. That's the electronic mode. And here you have the cavity mode. And as you change the temperature for the system, you see the cavity mode doesn't really change its position at all, but the exciton mode changes because it's a solid state system. The lattice constant changes, and as a result, the transition energy changes. So this moves on through, and by looking at the splitting as a function of temperature, you can measure the mixing, which is on the order of 20 gigahertz, which is, which is a nice amount. So why look at the magnetic system, which is going to be down by essentially factors of the fine structure constant, uh, couple of orders of magnitude relative to the electric dipole. It's going to be weak in principle. And the argument that we were looking at was that you can use a collective system which has a ladder of states which can coherently exchange the photons with the cavity and then you get an amplification of the effect. So your light can come in, it can move you from one state up, also to another state and still more. And again, you can get mixing but not only will you get a a, an effectively stronger interaction because you have all these spins collectively moving together, but you really have the prospect for multiple combinations of spin and photon state that are entangled together in whatever state you have in the system. Okay, so this is the theorist picture of this, a spherical cavity because theorists like spherical cavities. A spherical magnet, because we also like spherical magnets. Uh, it's off-center, and that's just a symmetry issue there. But uh, you'll notice that it's, it's, this is the figure from the paper. It's also labeled nanomagnet. We'll come back to that later. Small magnets are also particularly good, and uh, I'll try to tie to some of the comments that we've heard earlier today about the large number of spins that are involved. Okay, so you have the spherical uh, magnet interacting with your spherical cavity. Your magnetic field is oriented uh, in the z direction here. That uh, spin is going to process around and it will interact with the 
modes of the cavity. All right. And so this is essentially ferromagnetic resonance. It's something that's been known for over 70 years at this point. And uh, we know that independent spins, not exchange-locked spins moving collectively, but independent spins would be adding randomly. But if they are exchange-locked, you end up with an extra square root of s contribution. And so that's the enhancement that we have. So if you have 10 to the 9 spins, which is a good number, it's a number that you get for a nanomagnet as opposed to a much larger system where you might get 10 to the 16. But if you have 10 to the 9 spins, then perhaps you could be in a regime where you have the same number of spin excitations and the same number of, uh, of photons. But it, it remains a challenge. OK, so uh, for I always like to show this because many people have used Cattell's book to learn solid state physics, and they have no idea what he did. Uh, so this is uh, also 70 years ago, his contribution to ferromagnetic resonance. And this, these high quality, these uh, oscillators from ferromagnetic resonance are used in high frequency microwave circuits, and they give you these very high quality filters. So this is an image that uh, Hong Tang provided, which I, I like, even though as an engineer, he looks at it and he says, this is a terrible sphere. I make much better spheres at this point. But many of the initial experiments that he did were done on a sphere that was harvested from an oscilloscope directly. All right, so what are the advantages? You have this. Uh, disadvantage that the dipole coupling is smaller than the electric dipole. However, the collective behavior of the spins will increase the matrix elements to, to compensate for that. And so you should be able to get strong coupling between the nanomagnet and the photon field that's much stronger than the electric dipole coupling in a solid where you only have the two levels to work with. In addition, the spin coherence times will be much larger than the exciton coherence times, and you have a magnetic field tuning instead of temperature tuning. So that was the motivation for this uh, proposal from some time ago. OK, so let's look a little bit more in detail at what this, uh, all right, let's look a little bit more in detail at this set of states and the interaction of these spins with the photons. You have a cavity nanomagnet Hamiltonian that's just from the electric and magnetic fields. So this is the cavity mode here. This is the interaction with the uh, nanomagnet itself, which you can separate into, into appropriate modes. And you end up with a Hamiltonian that looks relatively straightforward, although there is uh, dependence of these terms coupling the, uh, the spin and the photon modes on the number of spins and the number of photons in the system. So in order to look at that, we considered a case where you start with a nanomagnet oriented in the highest energy configuration in that magnetic field and no photons in the cavity. So you, that's the number that we have of excitations in the system. And so we're working with a range from all spin excitations and no photons to all photon excitations and no spins. And you have, in principle, 10 to the 9 possible positions along that row corresponding to uh, different numbers of spin, um, different spin projection along the axis, and different number of microwave photons. And the coupling between these is the coupling that you're going to get uh, from the number of photons and the number of spins, and it varies with that. The biggest coupling comes near the halfway point, as you might expect. So this is mathematically similar to the Dickey model, and it can be described as a type binding model going across where I'm going to have n as the number of photons, but there's an implied number of spins because I've fixed that number in the system. And so that hopping from one to the other varies with n. And so I have a non-uniform type binding model that you can then solve for the states 
of that that are extended states and therefore entangled spin photon states. All right, and this is what they look like. Uh, again, 10 to the 9 spins, exchange locked. These are our parameters, which may be somewhat different from experimental parameters, but uh, we liked them. Big cavity, big field, unrealistic frequency, but you know. <laughs> Uh, and so this is, the, uh, this is the lowest energy mode of the two in that effective type binding model, and it's distributed across about 10 of the 5 states of spin and photon number. The next one, the next one, and this is something like the 300th state here, so you continue to build these up so you can make pulses out of the system by adding these up together and then allowing them to evolve over a coherence time for that cavity, for that uh, nanomagnet. Okay, so if you move to a continuum model for this, you end up with an effective potential for where you are, which looks like this. And so you, you can just think about having this effective potential for your spin photon combination. It's a fictitious particle that is living in there. And uh, your states are in this uh, somewhat distorted quantum well that you build up. And by constructing coherent superpositions, you can make pulses that go back and forth. And then you can ask, how long are, are they going to evolve during the coherence time of uh, of the nanomagnet. Uh, for this analysis, which was involving an entangled state of about 10 to the 6 spins and photons, uh, the oscillation time we were getting was on the order of a few microseconds. And that's a bit optimistic, even at uh, ideal temperatures for YIG, uh, we'd want it to be about 10 times faster. And so at the time, we suggested this could be increased by cavity engineering, enhancing the mode in the nanomagnet location, which would enable you to get this to go back and forth faster. So this being able to do a full coherent oscillation doesn't seem completely impractical for that kind of, uh, of small system. But again, we're talking about a nanomagnet on the order of 10 to the 9 spins, not really something that's very much larger. Okay, so that's an approach that would be based on enhancing the cavity mode. Is there anything that we can do with the magnon uh, itself? And for that, um, we're going to look at the electric field control. But first, I wanted to show the uh, examples of RF magnon coupling experiments. I think you've seen these already because uh, you know we heard from uh, 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 this author and his group this morning, and uh, I imagine that we will hear from Hong uh, tomorrow, and we'll hear as well uh, from there. So this is a low temperature result showing these anti-crossings. Uh, one of the things that um, I really liked about Hong's work here was that this is a room temperature result, showing that you can get this effect even up at room temperature with oscillations along. Okay, let me move to the electric field control of the spin wave velocity. So this is an experiment where you have an antenna on one side, another antenna on the other side. So this excites spin waves, this detects them. And then there's an electrode in the middle that's applying an electric field to try to adjust the spin wave velocity of the system. The motivation for this was some calculations that had uh, been begun by, uh, uh, by Tian Yu uh, before she joined my group when she was working with Giovanni Vignale. But they did a calculation from the jaloshinsky maria interaction of the shift in the spin wave velocity. Uh, as a function of voltage for yttrium iron garnet, showing that it is non-negligible, in principle could be measured. So adapting that for this geometry that 
that Hong Tang was looking at, uh, we considered this system where you have the electrode is here, the antennas, spin wave propagating that way, electric field perpendicular. And this is the shift in the frequency. Uh, this is the phase shift as a function of frequency, uh, shown here for an electric field uh, in the proper orientation to generate a jalshinsky marie interaction and what was intended to be the control experiment where the electric field is not going to generate a jalshinsky marie interaction. And then on the right here is as a function of electric field. So you can see there's a very substantial out-of-plane electric field effect which corresponds in magnitude to what is predicted for the jalshinsky marie interaction. So this uh, line that is going through here is not a fit to the points. It is a theoretical calculation for that particular system, and it's in very good agreement. Now this line here is a guide to the eye because we do not have a theory for that effect, but it does seem to suggest that there is a non-negligible magnetoelectric effect that is occurring for in-plane electric fields in YIG. So what's nice about this is that it is larger than the linear multiferroic magnetoelectric effect, and it doesn't require strain because when you try to use piezoelectric effects to get the same kind of uh, phenomena using piezoelectrics and then uh, uh, magnetostriction effects, you, uh, you can't cycle the system that many times before it starts to fail. All right, so what about amplifying this effect in a magnetic crystal? So here we were looking at a one-dimensional geometry with a periodic application of electric field. Again, the motivation here is looking at uh, work that had been done on magnetic crystals, which uh, can be done in a static fashion. So here are some examples where there are patterns in the YIG. So this can be done with grooves in the magnetic insulator to make a uh, magnetic crystal, very much like a photonic crystal, but for spin waves. Here is with width modulations of permaloy. Uh, it can also be done with ion implantation. But this is something that you cannot adjust dynamically. Now there are things that are switchable. So this is, uh, these are some dynamic magnetic crystals. You can modulate a magnetic field, you can modulate a current, you can modulate surface acoustic waves. But all of these are going to be dissipative in some fashion. When you're running current, you're going to get dissipation. When you're generating the magnetic field, you also are going to be getting dissipation. And so it would be better if it's possible to do this with an electric field or a voltage, because there, if you're just dropping electric fields across the system, uh, it will not take very much current at all to charge up the capacitor. Uh, and so you can eliminate almost entirely these kinds of joule heating effects. So we wanted to look to see if it were possible to make these things realistically with electric fields and voltage, at least uh, when I say realistically, keep in mind this is from a theorist's perspective. So uh, here's the picture. This is a kind of interdigitated uh, electrode similar to what one might use to launch a surface acoustic wave, uh, but here, it's intended to be applying this alternating electric field in the system. Uh, it's going to have two values, A and B, so that's the red and the blue. And so you're making a magnetic crystal out of a slab of material that is uniform in structure and composition, but is varying in terms of the electric field that is applied. And we're, keeping, we're thinking of this as YIG. So calculating the properties of that system, you can do that with the LLG equations. And this uh, effective field that enters in is where you're going to put your jalshinsky marie interaction. Uh, and that's, it's known how that is done. It turned out that it had not been worked out what the interface terms are when you have an inhomogeneous jalshinsky marie interaction. So uh, when you do that, you end up with a somewhat more complicated form, but one that describes what happens as this, uh, as this D vector, which is the effective field within the jalshinsky marie interaction as that changes as you go from uh, point to point. So you'll get interface terms from that. 
And so the calculations then for what happens are shown here. On the bottom is shown the density of magnetic states as a function of a uniform electric field. So that's just going to shift the lowest energy of the, of the system. If you have equal and opposite electric fields, you don't get any significant effect because you shift the spin wave velocity the same way. You want to have one electric field that's nearly zero and the other electric field that is large. And that opens up a gap in the system. So this is a magnetic gap that's created entirely from the electric field effect. Uh, and this is for a larger value of electric field showing a larger gap. And so for electric fields that are not, well, I can say realistic, but how about I say not completely crazy, you can get uh, gaps in the system that are of width comparable to ten, uh, tenths or half of a gigahertz, which is pretty substantial. And you can also move the center around, although that's much less, much less interesting. So this is for a repeat unit of 200 nanometers. So it's 100 nanometers of one electric field, 100 nanometers of the next. And then this is a function of that repeat unit, showing that the size, that width is uh, pretty stable, depending, doesn't depend too much on that repeat size. So you may not need to have it quite as small as, as a 200 nanometer repeat width. Okay, so the goal here is to try to move magnons in and out of resonance with a cavity mode by adjusting the electric field. All right, so as a set of highlights, I've talked about some coherent interactions of spin waves with electromagnetic fields. This is essentially a two-particle strong coupling effect with microwave fields. I've also talked about electric field control, spin wave propagation, and amplification in magnetic crystals. Uh, here are a set of other things that I've not talked about, but also with some references if you have an interest in, in those topics. So thanks very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions.